another celebrity economist, uh, Nathan Sheets. Nathan will give us a very comprehensive snapshot, I believe, of uh, the key themes that are going to shape up the economy going forward, what he calls as a post-viral economy. Nathan's erudition and his really long bio are unparalleled. He's a renowned economist. He has held several distinguished, distinguished positions in the investment profession. And he's also had a very long career in policy making. Chief amongst uh, Nathan's policy works has been his contribution to the US Treasury, where he has been the, an advisor, the Federal Reserve Board, as well as the International Monetary Fund. Nathan Sheets is currently the chief economist and head of global macroeconomic research at PGIM Fixed Income, uh, heading their fixed income. Uh, Nathan earned, earned his PhD from the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has written a thesis, his PhD thesis was uh, an intersectoral study on uh, the effect of exchange rates, interest rates, and investments. Uh, enjoy the session. Over to you, Nathan. Well, uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. Very honored to be part of this conference. And what I would like to do is share with you some themes that I think will frame the uh, post-COVID global economy. As I say this, I think they do apply to the global economy, of course, to various countries to, uh, to differing extents, but I think they're a broad ap uh, applicability. So the, the first one is uh, we've been through this extraordinary period, and I think that there are going to be some hangovers or some scarring uh, associated with it. Uh, part of that uh, will be uh, higher uh, unemployment. Workers have seen their skills deteriorate. Some small firms and other firms have gone out of business during this period. Uh, and a very big part of it is in order to provide support to our economies, we have seen extraordinary monetary and, and fiscal stimulus. And I think that uh, our central banks and our governments are going to emerge with much, much larger uh, balance sheets, more liquidity in the system, and uh, higher levels of, of public debt. And I think there's some risks that are associated with this that we'll need to be aware of and we'll need to manage. Uh, one risk that history says we should, we should monitor for is the risk of inflation. And I'm probably a little more relaxed about that in the advanced economies, given where they've been over the last uh, decade, uh, but a little more worried in the emerging markets, given that those uh, economies have been somewhat more dynamic. Uh, and I think more dynamic economies have the advantage of growing faster, but are also uh, more likely to overheat. Another related risk that we've seen uh, over the last 20 years is the risk of asset bubbles. Maybe all of this liquidity in the system will generate financial stability risks. Uh, a third concern I have uh, related to this is the risk of sustained uh, slow growth. And uh, in particular, I'm concerned that with higher public debt levels and some deterioration of private sector balance sheets as well, it will move into a period of deleveraging that the higher debt levels will create uncertainty. And putting all of this together, it will uh, lead to uh, slower growth. So I, I, I think that these are going to be important uh, risks and challenges uh, for the policy process and policymakers uh, to wrestle with uh, in the years ahead. And in some sense, I think that these overhangs are likely to form the backdrop uh, against which uh, private sector uh, markets and investors are operating. This kind of brings me then to what I see as being the second major theme. And I think this is really the, the key one and the one I'd like to emphasize the most is uh, I think that uh, the post-COVID period will be a period of sectoral rebalancing and there will be distinct winners and, and losers. Uh, I think on the winner side, uh, pretty much anything associated with technology is likely to be a winner. 
I think we're seeing through this episode that technology has the capacity to bring us together uh, in, 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 in ways that we didn't fully appreciate. Tech was important before COVID, but I think we're seeing it even become even more powerful and more central. And I think technology has the capacity uh, to transform the way uh, that we're entertained, the way we get information, uh, the way we're educated, the way we communicate with each other, uh, and so forth. A closely uh, correlated uh, a shift is uh, a shift toward e-commerce away from bricks and mortar uh, retail. And I think people are really enjoying being able to click on a button and, uh, and uh, have the boxes show up at their home. It's a much more efficient way uh, to shop and uh, to purchase uh, than actually having to get in the car or whatever, or go to the store and, and, and buy things. Another winner is the consumer staple sector. I think we're seeing that regardless of what else happens, there are certain things that we as human beings really need. We need food, we need certain medical supplies, we need certain kinds of, of paper products and so forth, and that those are indispensable. And I think the firms producing those are likely to be winners. Uh, on the loser's side, I think it's all sorts and types of face-to-face -face services, airlines, hotels, restaurants, theaters. I think these folks are, uh, are, are likely to see a uh, challenge. Uh, you know, we've already seen a fair amount of this in uh, the actual period of transition uh, during uh, the virus, but I think it's going to uh, persist on the other side. I think that there are going to be some ongoing uh, significant changes uh, in our behavior. Uh, one reason I think this is the case is I think that we're learning how to use a new set of, of, of tools uh, and developing new skills. I think all of us are better with teleconferences, Zoom and WebEx and so forth than we were before. And uh, if, uh, if before the virus, I was making, let's say, a dozen trips abroad every year. On the other side of the virus, am I still going to travel internationally? Absolutely. There is value to face-to-face -face contact. But a few of those trips, when I say, well, I think I can accomplish essentially the same objectives uh, with other means through virtual connections, I think it probably yes, and I won't travel as much. And uh, that time that I would have spent traveling, I can put to uh, other uses. Uh, this then brings me to a discussion of productivity. And I think that's the third major theme for the, uh, uh, the post-COVID era. That I think that we will see some sectoral shifts and, and, and deep, almost tectonic shifts in, uh, in, in productivity. There's some really uh, big changes. So on the one hand, as I mentioned, as a result of the virus, we've learned how to use a set of tools that we didn't uh, know how to use as well before. And not only is it kind of on an individual basis, but it's, it's been society-wide. So as a result of, of COVID-19, I think many of us have learned how to do business differently. Uh, and I think much of what we learn will persist on the other side and will help make us more efficient, more productive, reduce our travel times, uh, reduce commuting uh, time, and allow us uh, to, be, to be more productive. So I think that there is an upside risk as COVID passes, and we all come back uh, uh, to work. We come back to work, but it looks a little differently, uh, different than it did before. And uh, we're more productive as we utilize these tools. Now, the flip side of this is I've also described a period of sectoral rebalancing, uh, uh, which will likely uh, entail also a shift of employment and a shift of resources from some of these uh, services sectors and in some of these other sectors like tech and consumer staples that I described as, as, as likely winners. But uh, 
a concern is that these services sectors are very rich in terms of their capacity to provide jobs. And these other sectors employ, but not nearly to the same extent. So it leaves me a little bit concerned that through this period of transition, there may be a reduced demand for labor. And more broadly, we may see capital ob obsolescence and other kinds of disruptions. So on the one hand, hopefully we'll all be more efficient. On the other hand, it's gonna be going on in the context of, uh, of uh, some deeper shifts in the economy, which could weigh on employment and weigh on productivity through a transition. So the, as I said, there are these deep factors at work. I'm hopeful that this will open the door to a more productive economy and we'll all be more efficient. Uh, but this is uh, a set of issues that's gonna be really important in shaping economic performance and the performance of, of markets and various sectors uh, in the years ahead. The uh, next uh, uh, theme, the fourth theme, is uh, intensified inequality. And uh, I think that in many of our countries, we are seeing a substantial, and in many cases, a growing gap uh, between the rich and the poor. As I say, I think this is a global issue manifesting itself in the politics of many countries, but it's particularly uh, a challenge for the United States. And I think that for the US, not only did we enter the COVID episode uh, with these challenges of inequality, but the virus has fallen uh, and its costs have fallen disproportionately on poorer communities. Uh, lower paid workers have been more likely to lose their jobs. Alternatively, lower paid workers have been more likely to uh, be declared as essential and have to go into harm's way and face the public and perform their functions uh, on a daily basis through this, uh, through this uh, period. And uh, uh, many of these folks live in communities that are more dense. And as a result of that, have, have uh, been more exposed to the virus and have had higher case counts and, and fatalities. So during the summer, uh, I think we saw frustration about inequality, about the incidence of the virus and the pain that people were feeling spill over onto our streets in terms of the protests. And I think that the, the immediate trigger for that was issues about the way the police were behaving and, 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 and racial tensions in the United States. I think that behind it were these issues of unfairness in terms, a sense of unfairness as to uh, how the virus was, was impacting uh, people and these deeper issues of inequality. So I think that inequality in this, this set of issues is gonna be a key part of the US presidential uh, election over the next few months is going to be a key part of U.S. politics, and I would say global politics uh, in, uh, in the years ahead. So uh, then the final theme that I'd like to, to highlight is one that was with us even before the virus hit, and that is aging global demographics. Uh, I see demographics as a deep and powerful factor that is quietly but inexorably affecting economic performance. Uh, and uh, this is true in the advanced economies, uh, in the de de developed markets, where uh, many of these countries are seeing actual contractions in their working age populations. It's also true in the emerging markets where uh, China and Korea uh, in particular are going to also see contractions in their working age populations in the years ahead. And in India, uh, the working age population will continue to grow, but at a much slower pace than in, in previous decades. And I think that there is mounting evidence that aging demographics are uh, correlated with and help generate reduced demand. As societies uh, get older, they spend less, uh, uh, their demand is, is reduced. This translates into weaker growth, lower inflation, and lower nominal 
uh, interest rates. It has a very powerful effect on the macroeconomy and financial markets. And I think the empirical evidence on this is becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly powerful. Uh, as a result, I think that this ongoing process of aging demographics is going to be maybe the most important factor driving the global economy, driving trade and capital flows and migration patterns and growth and inflation uh, in, in the coming decades. And it's something that we will all have to think about in, in our investment decisions, how our shifts in, in demographics influencing various firms and sectors, and more broadly in terms of our macro uh, economic uh, outlooks. So uh, putting this uh, all together, my sense is that the post-COVID era will be a period of challenges, but it will also be a period uh, of opportunities. I think in many respects, it will be like the, the, the uh, post-global financial crisis period where growth will be relatively restrained, inflation will be low, rates will be low, and central banks will uh, be uh, very st uh, stimulative. I think this will be a, a low wall macro environment, but I also think partially for exactly those reasons, it's also likely to be a high vol uh, a political environment. And it will behoove all of us to think about the economics and the finance, but we're also gonna to have to be thinking really carefully about the, about the politics. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, uh, been a, a real honor to be able to share my views with you today and wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan, for uh, those insights. Uh, I, ladies and gentlemen, I hope